All right. Welcome, everybody. My name is Matthew Faraber. I'm the coordinator of the Visual World Investigate Lab. That's one of the three Investigate Labs here at the Nature Research Center. It's up on the third floor. Uh, I'd like to begin by just uh, asking a couple questions. How many, for how many people is it their first visit to the Nature Research Center? Quite a few, okay. All right, great. Well, um, again, welcome. So there are three Investigate Labs in this museum. They're labs that are open seven days a week to the public. Admission is free, just like it is for the rest of the museum. And there are spaces where the public can come to learn about science, uh, do hands-on activities, and learn about how science is done. And they're designed so that they change over time. So us coordinators are constantly adding new exhibits, new projects, and new classes to these spaces so that hopefully every time people come, there's something new that they can experience. And this, this is what my lab looks like. So it's called the Visual World Investigate Lab, and it is formally about scientific visualizations, teaching through the use of maps, models, animations, and simulations, which can see, sound pretty, or seem pretty dry, especially to kids. So I try to spice it up with lots of different types of technology, both software and hardware. So an example of one of my favorite types of software-based technologies that I like to work with is a technology called augmented reality, which allows you to create the illusion that you are manipulating 3D objects with your, with your body, with your hand. So here, if you look on the screen here, I'm holding a 3D model of the Earth. And this is a model of the Earth as it looks today. Every day I get new imagery uh, from NASA satellites, and then people can overlay a couple dozen different types of environmental data onto the Earth and mix the different types of data to see how uh, one thing might influence another. But aside from that, uh, I also do uh, quite a bit of electronics and robotics because after a few months of being open, I came to the realization that not everyone was necessarily interested in interacting with a computer, sp computer screen, especially if it was a group of uh, a, a family group. Not everyone was always interested. So I decided to come up with some other type of exhibit for the room. And I decided that uh, one great way to engage kids might be uh, having electronic displays and electronic activities. And so this wasn't something I had done too much in the past. I grew up with computers and I, I tinkered with things. As they broke, I would try to take them apart and fix them and usually fail. Um, but I saw this as a great opportunity to both learn a skill that I'd always wanted to learn, that I couldn't justify the time to learn, and also uh, try to inspire children as well to do the same thing. And I think it's been uh, quite successful. And so I've learned quite a lot about using electronics, especially affordable electronics. And I've found several different ways that they can be incorporated into the museum uh, environment. Um, so I'd like to ask everyone uh, another question. I assume you're here today because you, have, you are thinking of or have thought of the past of using electronics uh, to create something in your museum but you just you, you didn't know where to start or you didn't think you could afford to put something together. Does anyone have any examples of that that they might be able to give me? Yes. Ah, okay. So uh, 3D scanning was brought up. That's a great one. And there are quite a few ways that 3D scanning can be achieved. Uh, some require um, uh, devices that you buy that can range from uh, $150 to thousands of dollars. And then there are other methods that require simple cameras. So that's a really great example because there are ways to achieve 3D scanning uh, that will give you really good results. They're very expensive, but there are also ways to achieve it using uh, uh, probably what you already have. And there are lots of many, there are many other examples, and I'm going to be going over some of them. So one thing that I've learned 
uh, doing this is that there is an entire culture of people that have been doing getting into electronics in recent years. Uh, and the result, the reason for that is because all the devices that are in your pockets, all of your computers, every, every electronic gadget that you have is probably mass produced. And all those thousands of components of, that are inside there are mass produced. And that means that all those individual components, which today are quite powerful, are all very inexpensive. And so there's this entire culture of people that acquire these parts, usually online, figure out how to put something together, and then post their results and post uh, instructions on how they created whatever it was they created online. And one great example of that is this new maker culture that we have going on. So Make is a, is a magazine, and it's a, it's a website, and it's a place where you can buy parts, but they also host a fair. And in fact, they host, there are about 100 maker fairs scattered throughout the world that uh, people participate in each year. And so what they do there is they, they go there to learn how to create things, they go there to teach, about how, to teach how to create things, and they go there to show off their things. So it's kind of like a giant show and tell for adults and, of course, many, many kids. And I see the excitement in electronics on, in a, on a daily basis. One of the things I do in my lab whenever anyone comes in, uh, especially children, if they seem at all inclined or interested in the electronics that I have on display, is I ask them if they'd like to do a little experiment. And so what I do is I, I hand them one of these, a little LED, and I ask them if they know what it is. And then I hand them one of these, a little coin cell battery, and I ask them if they know what it is. And then I ask them if they'd like to do an experiment if they would uh, try putting them together and see what happens. And if they put it together in just the right way, they'll get light. And so you would be amazed the reactions that we get on a daily basis from this very, very simple activity of just getting an LED to light up, just using the, the fewest parts possible. They'll do this and then they'll say what other colors they can try out, what other colors will light up. Then they'll try multiple LEDs, and then they'll start asking questions. Why, do some, why are some colors brighter than others? Why do some combinations of colors work and other combinations don't? And so there's this whole process that they end up going through in their minds just from a little two cent battery and a little two cent LED. So, why electronics? Well, as I already told you, uh, it, it inspires people, um, it inspires kids to create things, but it's also a great opportunity for you to create things in your museum, um, uh, whether it's um, electronic exhibits or just simple LEDs or robots. And so robots is one of my favorite things to make because robots are very, um, uh, they're very exciting and everyone's interested. And they're kind of like a, a gateway technology a, 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 that gets kids really asking questions and, and wondering how they, can put some, how they can make something like a robot as well. And so I have lots of different examples. I have uh, robots that navigate autonomously using infrared light. I have robots that navigate autonomously using sonar. And I have uh, um, a few others on display as well, like that one in the bottom right-hand corner. But a lot of you are probably in museums where it doesn't necessarily make sense to uh, use electronics to make robots, for example. There are lots of other things that you can make. Um, you can use simple electronics, and I'm going to go over them individually to make uh, typical museum exhibits. And so here's one that I put together in just a day, so forgive me, using a scrap piece of fiberboard, some printer paper, and uh, a, uh, a glue stick. And uh, I added some electronics to make it interactive. Some lights, some buttons, and then this little microcontroller right here on the bottom. 
And so I'm going to go over that one quite a bit. Basically, it's a little device that you can attach all sorts of things to, LEDs, motors, sensors. And then you hook it up to a computer, send some code to it, and then that code will tell all those little parts what to do. So I'll turn this on for you so you can see. I think that this is a, this is a really simple example of what you can make, but I, I think hopefully it'll give you an idea of how, how powerful this is and uh, how many different things you can make with it. So in this case, I've created a predator-prey matching game. So you have three predators and three prey items. And uh, now if I was going to make this for actual use in the lab, I would, of course, hide all the electronics in the back. But all, that, all that's behind this is a bunch of wires. All the electronics are out front so that you can see. So in this case, uh, the whale, if I press the krill, if I press krill, I get a green light. The next one is a cat. If I press the bird, I get a green light. The next one is a dinosaur. If I click the wrong one, I'll get a red light. And it'll wait patiently until I get the correct one. And it'll just go on and on from there. Now, I could reprogram this as many times as I want to do other things as well. Another example would be uh, video displays. You can use simple electronic boards, like one I'm going to get into in detail, to play HD videos or to uh, play computer programs that uh, you've developed or, or to show off websites that maybe show some live content or something like that, whether it's a feed from the space station or an eagle cam or live earthquake data from somewhere using inexpensive electronics rather than full-blown computers. So what exactly are your hardware options? I'm going to go over some of the most common ones. This is my favorite one right here. And according to the internet, this is probably the number one favorite as well. So this is a little electronic circuit board. And there are three important parts to it. The big black rack rectangle there is a microchip. It's called a microcontroller. It's basically like a little tiny $2 computer. Over on the left is a USB port. That's what you'd use to hook it up to a computer to send code to that microcontroller. And then at the top and on the bottom are what they call pins. They're actually pin holes, but they call them pins. And many of them have numbers by them. So then what you would do is you would attach an LED or a motor or some kind of sensor to the pinhole and then you'd use a code to say okay pin number three send out electricity to the LED or pin number six receive electricity from the sensor from the temperature sensor from the gas sensor so it's extremely powerful um, I use it for many things that board is using it uh, these one of these robots is using it so Arduino is a company that produces these boards. They're open source hardware and software, which means that the instructions to build these are online. So lots of people do. So there are lots of different versions of these, some that are quite powerful and some that are very, very tiny, just like almost like a single microchip. And they range in cost from $10 up to $50 or probably more. This is the most commonly used board and the most popular one. So if you go searching um, into Arduino for the first time, look up the Arduino Uno. This is the one that you'll find the most amount of information on because it can do quite a lot of things. And uh, the official board is about $24, I believe. But you can get clones for less. The clone that I'm using down there, I believe, was $17. So the next thing, the Raspberry Pi. This is a really exciting gadget. So it isn't much bigger than the Arduino. And it can do a lot of the same things. You can attach motors to it. You can attach LEDs to it. You can attach sensors to it. And uh, you can program it to 
interact with all those things just like you would the Arduino. However, it is significantly more powerful and it is in fact an entire computer. Uh, this is a computer uh, in just the way that uh, my laptop is a computer. You can attach a monitor to it, you can attach a keyboard, you can attach a, a mouse, and you can give it an operating system. In particular, this runs Linux. It can run many different versions of Linux. And Linux is a free operating system. And so you can use this uh, for a video display, for a exhibit that's running a computer program. And it has many different inputs and outputs. It has a couple USB ports. It has an Ethernet port. Excuse me. It has audio out. It has an SD card, which is what its hard drive is. It even has an RCA jack, which you can use to output to an old CRT TV. So if you have one of those laying around in a closet somewhere from an ancient museum exhibit, you could give it new life by getting one of these. And they're $35. That's the kicker. It's an entire computer for $35. And uh, there are many versions of this as well, but this is the most popular, the Raspberry Pi. <clears throat> now another bit of technology that you may be interested in is 3D printing. I have one of these in the lab as well. I did not bring it with me. It's pretty heavy. Um, uh, these range in price from, I think, the cheapest I've seen so far is about $400, but they can go up to tens of thousands of dollars, depending upon what you want to make. A decent one is about maybe $1,500 or $2,000. They'll print out something quite nice. And so just in case you don't know what one of these things is, it's a machine that will produce a 3D object. For example, we've had ours for just a few weeks. We haven't done too much. But this little box here was created using a 3D printer. It has a spool of plastic behind it. It's very much, it looks and, and is very much like fishing line. And what it does is it melts it down and then slowly, slowly extrudes it into whatever shape you want. And so there are two different ways that you can get, get it to produce shapes. You can either get a model file from online. There are lots of repositories online. For example, a great one is the Smithsonian. They've been scanning their artifacts, and they have their models available online. And they're, they're, uh, uh, they did that so that you can do exactly that. You can grab the model, and you can print it out yourself and have a replica of one of their artifacts. But you can also create the models yourself. And not just from scanning. You can use free software to create a model of anything that you can imagine. And it'll print it out. Here's another example. This is a bolt and a screw. So it printed this out in one go. And they fit together really well. The resolution is quite high on some of these. And so you can use it to build little, little props for your exhibits. Or you can use it um, as a backup to to create things that maybe have broken, maybe parts of your exhibits have broken. You can use this to recreate those parts. They're extremely popular right now. I believe, so this is the MakerBot Replicator 2. I believe it was $2,000. I could be wrong about that. And so I also wanted to talk a little bit about software options. Um, a lot of times people don't realize that a lot of the most common software packages that you use or that you've heard of or that you learned how to use in school, there are uh, free alternatives that exist um, because software can get quite expensive, especially if you're trying to produce something of museum quality. So here are some of my favorite free programs. Now I'll tell you what each one is an alternative for. The first one, LibreOffice, that's an alternative to Microsoft Office. So if you got a computer uh, that doesn't have an Office suite on it or something like uh, Office suite, this is a program that you can get 
that has a ver its own version of Word, its own version of Excel, PowerPoint, and several others. And it's all compatible with, with uh, the Microsoft programs as well. GIMP. GIMP is a photo editor, so it's an alternative to Photoshop. So you can use that to do photo editing and create graphics with. It's the most popular and probably the most updated of all the free graphics programs. Inkscape. Inkscape is a graphics editor as well. However, it's a vector graphics editor. So what you can do is you can use it to, uh, to create an image out of lines and points. And even if you have thousands upon thousands of lines, you can always go back to any of those lines and adjust them very, very easily to make something that looks really perfect. So for example, back to my super impressive museum exhibit here. Uh, all of these images I made in about an hour and a half using Inkscape. So I pulled in some photographs from online, I put them into the program, and then I used the tools in the program to trace around the photographs uh, to make some really smooth lines. And in the end, I come out with some, it comes out with some really nice looking graphics. It's actually a really fun program to use because even if, you're, even if you've never done photo editing before, or even if you're not uh, creatively inclined, you end up feeling like you are because it's so easy to use. Blender. Blender is one of my favorite programs. So Blender is a 3D modeling program. That's what you would use to create uh, 3D graphics for, uh, you can, of course, for print displays, but uh, specifically for videos and animations. And you would also use it to create, you can also use it to make 3D models for the 3D printer. It's the best of the free 3D modeling programs. There's, there are lots of 3D modeling programs. And 99% uh, of the time when you hear that someone uh, knows how to do 3D modeling, it's because they went to school for it and they ended up using a really expensive program like 3ds Max or something like that to do it. However, Blender is an extremely powerful program. I believe it's open source. I could be wrong about that. But it is completely free and updated regularly. And you can use it to make models, but you can also use it to make videos. So if you were to go to YouTube and look up Blender movies, for example, you'll see uh, uh, movies that almost look like they're produced by Pixar, just make, created by random people with their computers and their coffees of Blender. QGIS. So GIS is one of the things I do a bit of in my lab. I've used GIS uh, quite a bit professionally, and I feel very passionate about it. Uh, just in case you don't know, GIS stands for Geographic Information Systems. It uh, refers to digital map making. So unbeknownst to a lot of people, GIS is used by every large company, every government, every state, every country in the world because it is an extremely powerful tool to figure out where things are. And scientists use it to figure out where things uh, used to be, where things are now, where things will be. So it's extremely predictive. For example, you could send it a bunch of data um, showing where streams are in the state. And then you could send it a bunch of data showing where uh, public water intakes are. And then data showing where uh, wastewater treatment plants are located. And then you can ask it a question. You can ask it, where on streams are, will you find wastewater treatment plants that are within a mile, uh, for example, of water intakes? So you can send it a ton of data and ask it very specific questions, and it'll give you back the results. It'll give you back tabular results, and it'll give you back graphic results. And so very few, this is a skill that very few people learn, but uh, 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 when they do, they end up using uh, software that's very expensive. Yet again, most people use Esri. It kind of has the market cornered on GIS because it's great software. However, it does quite, cost quite a bit of money. QGIS is one of the best alternatives that I've found. And we use it for lots of, lots of things. In fact, one of the things I neglected to mention at the beginning is that uh, the Investigate Labs teach classes as well. We teach classes during the day to school groups, and we teach classes at night to the general public. 
So in my lab in particular, we teach classes on computer programming for beginners, electronics for beginners, GIS for beginners, uh, weather for beginners, and soon uh, we'll be teaching a formal robotics class for beginners as well. And so these are during the day, but then a couple times, twice a month, in the evenings, we open up for the general public as well. And they're very inexpensive, just $10 a person. And so in the case of GIS, for example, people have a couple options. They can, uh, we can go through an activity where they answer an e ecology-based question where a particular uh, threatened species occurs in North Carolina, or they can answer a question uh, about a hypothetical disease outbreak, where, it's, where it started. The last one I have up here, uh, video editing is something that uh, is always very, very expensive and it's, always, and it's very difficult to find good uh, free video editors. This is my favorite one that I have found, Demug Mode Wax. So you can use it if you're filming something for any reason and you want to add captions or you want to add uh, image overlays, that's a program that you can use. So, how to get started. All this can seem pretty intimidating. Um, and uh, a lot of people assume that you have to go to school, that you have to take classes. My background's in environmental science. Um, uh, everything that you see here from the augmented reality to the robots are just things I picked up since uh, college 10 plus years ago. A lot of people can do the same thing. A lot of people do do the same thing. We get questions every day from parents and kids asking how they can do this. And I show them the same way that I did. There are lots and lots of great websites. So if you, I mean, you can go through tutorial after tutorial, but if you like a class type structure, there are a couple options. Uh, one of the mo one popular option that I don't have up there is an option is a website called Coursera. So course and then E R A. So that's a structured uh, university style semester style uh, class that you can sign up for on a whole range of topics, both technology and everything else you can think of. If you like to do things more at your own pace, this is what I like to recommend. Code Academy. So that's a website specifically about computer programming. It has some of the most popular languages. And um, one of the secrets about programming is it doesn't really matter which one you pick to begin with. Once you get comfortable with one, any of the others uh, are significantly easier. Electronics and Arduino in particular. There are lots of great tutorials online. One of the, one of the best collections, I believe, is Adafruit's website. Uh, learn.adafruit.com. Those have great tutorials for beginners. All very well documented. You can even print each one out as a PDF and save it. Each step has big photographs, which are fantastic. For tutorials and ideas, uh, this is a website I tell everyone about uh, because it's, it's, it's technology is just a small part of it, instructables.com. So it's like a Wikipedia for people that like to make things and then share how they made those things. Everything from robots to paper craft to sewing to cooking you can find on that website. So you can go there to look up something specific. You, you have in your mind exactly what you want to make. And you can find lots of great tutorials there. But you can also go there for ideas. It's fantastic for ideas. So you can put in just a really general search or, or look by category. And you'll find hundreds and hundreds of examples uh, of things that people have made. And then to buy parts, there are very few places where you can buy these things in the store at least inexpensively. Uh, so I buy everything online. And two of my favorite options at the bottom here, Adafruit again, uh, that's a website. They have the tutorials, but uh, the, the majority of that website is selling little parts and kits as well. So you can get the Arduinos and the Raspberry Pis and the LEDs and the batteries and the wires and everything in between. SparkFun, same deal. 
Uh, they have lots of parts, all the same types of parts. And they also have tutorials as well. That's one of the ones that we uh, recommend the most to, to people and to kids because there's quite a bit that they can learn from that site and quite a bit that you can purchase. And so that brings me to the end of my slides. And I wanted to, I don't know what the time is, but I wanted to leave some time for any questions that people might have about what they're trying to do or what they're interested in doing. How, how archival the 3D printed objects are? That's a great question. I haven't seen anything about that. Um, I think that one of, the, one of the drawbacks to these is that uh, temperature does affect them. Um, they do have limits. So I haven't seen that question asked. I know that the plastic is very similar to fishing line plastic. Um, so it is technically made to last. However, the nice thing about it is that if you have a model file, um, after you print it out once, you can just print it out again later. And they're very, very cheap. Something like this just costs like uh, just a few cents to make, a few cents worth of plastic. Yes? Oh, well, so for example, this particular box here, uh, we have three of these. Um, this one has a big A on it, and it has a lid. And so this was created uh, by the co-coordinator, uh, Walt Gurley, in the lab. He uses it for his computer programming class. So he has three of these. He has a box labeled A and B and C. And he uses these to teach, um, in computer programming, to teach how variables work and what they are. So he'll do a little game where he puts something in one of the boxes and clearly shows people what it is. And then he'll mix the boxes up. So he's trying to be really sneaky about it, really quick about it. And then he asks some random person, well, where is the object? Which boxes are in? And of course, they're going to guess it right because the boxes are labeled. And that's how variables work. So that's an example. And I haven't done it yet, but I'm also going to, we are also going to be using it to build parts for the robots as well. Um, because you could, you could use it to build uh, this structure, for example, or legs, things like that. Yes? Or, or, have, or have people actually uh, manipulate them um, so that you don't have people actually touching your... Uh, you know, things from your permanent collection. Uh, so that's another option for 3D printers. Right, right. So um, just to restate that a bit, because I don't know that all of that was picked up. Uh, some, he was saying that some museums use the 3D printers to print out uh, replicas of artifacts that they don't want the uh, public touching, um, because, you can very, because there's no problem with touching a 3D printed object. So it gives people just another level of, uh, of engagement with that artifact to be able to touch a really nice replica of it. That's a great point. Yes? Um, oh. What are some of the um, most exciting things for your visitors in your lab that you found to be very popular, either the, with programming or with the Arduinos? Or is there something specific that you found really gets people excited? Uh, yes, I think um, the electronics in general get them excited. Uh, the robots in particular get them really, really excited. Um, because the robots that I like to build are autonomous. And so they have sensors on them that allows them to re interact with their environment. And so they constantly, we keep all of our electronics out uh, on low tables so that everyone can reach them and interact with them, uh, including the robots. And so people will constantly, will constantly get questions every day 
about what, what these are and what they can do. And then that's always followed up by, well, how can I do that myself? And so this is a great example. And I keep, if you look closely at these, they do not have shells or anything like that. I like people to be able to see all of the individual parts. Because while they might look complicated, it's mostly just a mess of, of wires. So robots are a great example. And then we get to share lots of resources with people um, so that they can learn how to do it on their own. And we can tell them about the classes as well. The other thing that I would say is uh, my favorite technology to do software-based is the augmented reality, which I'll show again for people that haven't seen it. So on this screen here, I have a program. And this program, uh, it's kind of like a, a mix of uh, ecology and, and GIS, which are both topics that are very boring to children. So my challenge was to make it exciting. And so I use augmented reality to do just that. So to give kids the ability to hold 3D models in their hands. And this is the first thing that we show everyone when they come in. We bring them to one of those stations with this program running on it. Because this is, this is the hook that gets them interested in everything else that's in the lab. So we've had a great response to this. Most people still haven't seen it because uh, it hasn't been widely adopted. It's mostly used for advertising. Um, there are some apps that use it. However, it's not used much in education. Uh, I do know that there are some museums that use it with uh, smartphones. However, I use it with big screens like this, so you're not, uh, you don't have to have your own device. What is the software? Uh, so the code, so it's, it's this involves uh, a couple different types of software. So the code that I, the code, the code is something that I wrote. Um, the, the models are created using Blender. Uh, and then there's, a, there's an overlay and there's an interface to it. And that was created using a program called, uh, called Unity. And that is there's a free version and there's a paid version. And the free version is limited to organizations of a certain size and private individuals. Um, uh, if, if, if you don't meet that threshold, then you have to get the paid version. And that's a program that's actually used for making video games, really, really good video games. Yes? Linking, thank you. Um, linking your school offerings um, with Common Core and North Carolina Essential Standards and how that has helped what you're doing or hindered what you're doing and how teachers are responding to that. Well, Common Core, um, that's a tough one because um, they either are or they're trying to get rid of that after about a year. But regardless, uh, yes. We, all of our classes are taught with uh, the state standards in mind. In fact, one of the things that the museum puts out is a guide called the Educator's Guide. And that lists all the classes that we teach and descriptions of each, and then links to the different types, the different standards that each class meets. And in fact, there's even a matrix in that PDF. So if you just want to look up, if, if you know what standards you're trying to meet, which is what most teachers are trying to do, you can just go to that matrix, look for the standards, and then it'll show you what classes are being taught to meet those standards. And, age level. and what? Age level. And age level, that is correct, yes. No, um, in my lab in particular, I, it's kind of a double-edged sword. Um, because I like to teach classes that aren't, and teach about topics that aren't typically offered in schools. And so it's, it's sometimes hard for teachers to justify it if it's not something that's specifically required. But uh, we continue to do it because we think it's important. Yes, sir. Just like to make a comment about the Arduino. Uh, there is a uh, show control standard called DMX for lighting and Arduino uh, through SparkFun has a library that you can use to control lighting from an Arduino. The programming is you can download it, you really don't have to code it yourself and you can control all kinds of LEDs, make them turn on and off, 
we are working with on the, on the battleship, we're going to take our plotting area where the old analog computers were and have it go to battle stations with LED lights that will go red and then there will be a voice coming on from an MP3 player controlled by the Arduino. Then it will go white on the particular piece of equipment and explain it. And we've already written the code, we've built the prototypes, and I, I don't think it's got, I've got more than 40 hours in the whole project. It's just amazing what you can do with the Arduino. There also, if I could just uh, proselytize a little bit about Arduino, there's a guy named Jeremy Bloom who looks to be 14 years old. He graduated from Cornell University. He wrote a book called Exploring Arduino, which is a whole series of tutorials, and he's got a whole bunch of YouTube things, and it's, it's, it's really amazingly simple stuff. It looks complicated, but it's really simple, and you know, if you're non-programming, you can figure it out pretty quickly. Yes, the, the, programming, uh, the programming environment was designed so that children can use it, and they do. Um, if you look up kids and Arduino online on YouTube, you'll find lots of examples of kids doing just that. Uh, to write a program to get an LED to blink, for example, takes two minutes tops worth of typing. It's, it's, it's really that simple. Yes? What's on the horizon for natural sciences with, uh, with all of these technologies and programming with the public? What's coming up in the next couple of years? Oh, I see. What's coming up in the next couple of years? Well, I'm thinking about that. Uh, quite a lot. Um, this, I think that science museums and all museums in general have an amazing opportunity to get on board with this, uh, to get on board with electronics and computer programming. It's something that's very inexpensive and it's something that you can teach. And once people learn how to do this, once people to learn how to do things like this, then the amount of opportunities that are open to them are astounding. There are many more jobs that are available for uh, 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 computer science jobs that are available and, com and computer technology jobs that are available than there are qualified applicants. And the thing is, companies don't care where you got your skills to build uh, a robot to program an Arduino. They don't, they don't care if you went to school for it. They don't care if you got a degree in it because you don't have to. There's no reason to. They're not going to turn you down just uh, in, uh, regardless of the fact that you made a robot but you don't have a, uh, a certificate to show for it. So I don't see any reason why um, all areas of uh, all museums, um, all community science centers can't offer programs because if you're getting if you're interested in using it in your museum to build something whatever it is so that means you have someone that's skilled in it why not share that knowledge it's free to share the knowledge and don't be intimidated if you don't know it perfectly if you're not an expert in it um, when I first started teaching classes uh, about a year ago in electronics what I did was um, I challenged myself to offer uh, a unique class every month, a unique uh, electronics class. So every month, uh, people would come in and we would build something new together. And so I did that for a year, and that forced me to learn these things inside and out. So I, I hope that the future is, is that there will be more offerings um, in computer sciences and technologies. Because there, um, you know, as, as we go through the years, uh, we're presented with more and more complex and technical problems and challenges that our state, that our country, that our planet is facing. And that's going to require uh, lots of technical solutions. And so if we have an opportunity to, to share this type of knowledge, and it can be done very easily and very cheaply, then I don't see why we don't. Any other questions? OK. Well, uh, I think I'm going to be going back up to my lab, maybe eat a little lunch. But if anyone has any questions, 
uh, afterwards, if they would like to check out my lab, it is open right now, feel free on the third floor. It's the funny looking room with all the crazy computer stations that uh, I designed in SketchUp um, a couple years ago. Uh, and I'll give you a tour and, and answer any questions that you have. So thank you very much for, for coming to listen to me today.